like the sea? I do. I love the beaches, I like making sandcastles, I love watching the waves. It's really nice and colourful. Have you ever been to the sea? Whether you have or not, I think I might have a story for you. Today's story is called Yak, and it's dedicated to Titus. Far, far away from anywhere in the mountains of Tibet, there lived a yak. Of course, he wasn't really far away from anywhere. He was near the snow and the ice and the sleet and the cold wind and wet grass and craggy rocks. All day, the blizzard howled and the sun was hidden behind clouds and the black crows flew about in the storm-tossed air. Yes, he was near all that. But he was far away from the shops and the picture books and the ice creams and the fireside and the cinema and the children going to school. Now the Yak hadn't got a name, so I'll just call him Yak. Well, Yak was very fond of sitting in a fairly quiet part behind some rocks and listening to the sound of the sea. He'd found a seashell, a lovely spiral seashell, and when he held it to his ear, he could hear the sea. Goodness knows how it got there, but there it was. And it was what Yak liked best in all the world. He usually hid the shell from other yaks and crows during the daytime, but at night when the stars were out, he could sit behind the rocks on the mountain and listen to the sound of the sea in the shell. And he was filled with a great longing to go to the seaside. So one day he picked up his spiral shell, said goodbye to the other yaks and set off. You might wonder how a yak carries a spiral shell while he's walking. If you were to look at the picture, you'll see he carried it on one of his horns. He didn't know which way to go, but he thought, I'll just keep walking till I get to the sea. So he walked all day, and in the evening he ate some grass and listened to the sea in his shell and went to sleep. He walked all the next day and the next, but still he couldn't come to the sea. All around him were the mountains. Sometimes he saw a herd of llamas and once saw an eagle flying high up in the air, but he never seemed to get nearer to the sea. One day he was drinking from a little fountain stream and feeling rather sad. He sat down beside it and took down his shell and listened. The stream was running, babbling over stones and looked at Yak and wondered what he was doing. So it asked him, what are you doing? Oh, I'm listening, said Yak. Oh, let me listen too, said the stream. So Yak held the shell up to the stream and the stream listened. Why, that's the sea, it said. That's the sea. Do you know the way? asked Yak. I do know the way, replied the stream. Why, I'm going there all the time. Just you follow me and you'll get there. Oh, thank you, said the Yak. And he followed it. Presently the stream grew bigger until at last it was a broad river with boats sailing on it. It would be nice to sail in a boat instead of having to walk, thought Yak. So he got on a boat and paid his fare, and away they went. The boat had a big red sail, and the wind blew it all along, while Yak just sat there, having a nice rest. At last they got to the seaside. It was wonderful. He sat down on the sand and watched the waves come in. They sounded exactly like they did in his seashell. Yak was very happy. This is nicer than the wet, cold mountains, he thought. He found a cave at last to sleep at night. Then, because it was so hot, he went to the barber's and had his long hair cut short. And after that, he went down to the beach again and gave the children rides on his back for two pence a time. He soon had enough money to buy all the hay and ice cream he wanted. It was very nice there. He liked the seaside. But best of all were the late evenings when it was growing dark and the people had gone home and the yak sat by himself outside his cave and listened to the sound of the sea and watched the ships passing in the distance and the sun set on the horizon and then in the dark the stars coming out one by one and the waves lapping on the shore. Maybe you'll get the chance to go to the sea sometime. 
It is a very nice place after all. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's story. I'll see you next time. see what that is in the distance. Well, today I have a story for you. It's called The Red Hat and this story is dedicated to Scarlet. Once upon a time there was a little fish swimming in the sea with a lot of other little fishes. All down below him the water looked dark and the deeper he went the darker it got. But when he looked up he could see the blue sky and a red hat. I would like that red hat, he thought. So he said goodbye to the other fishes and swam up and up and up till he got to the top of the water and all around him was the sea and big ships and above him was the blue sky and large white clouds and the red hat. He tried to swim higher but no matter how hard he tried he couldn't get higher than the top of the water. So he called out to a seagull that was flying just overhead. Oh, Mr. Seagull, please fly up high and bring me down that lovely red hat. I'd love to wear it. But the seagull said, You better go away, little fish, or I'll eat you for my breakfast. And he dived down at the little fish and tried to catch him in his big, sharp yellow beak. But the little fish swam under the water and got away. Then he saw a fisherman in a boat with a great long fishing line with a hook at the end of it. So he looked out of the water and said, Oh please, Mr Fisherman, will you try and catch that red hat in the sky for me with your long line and hook? You better watch out, said the fisherman, or I'll catch you. And he swirled the fishing line around his head three times and sent the hook spinning towards the little fish. But he just missed him and the little fish swam away. A little while later the little fish came to a river and there on the bank he saw an elephant who was singing a little song to himself. The elephant is large and fat, he eats so much of this and that, he likes to sit and gorge and cram on high and grass and strawberry jam. The little fish called out, will you please stretch out your long trunk and fetch me down that red hat from the sky? So the elephant stretched out his trunk as far as he could. He stretched and he stretched and he stretched, but he still couldn't reach the red hat. I'll tell you what I'll do, he said. I'll pick you up in my trunk and throw you as high as I can, right up in the sky, and you can fetch down the hat for yourself. So he picked up the little fish and threw him high in the air, higher than the clouds, right up into the blue sky. And the little fish looked and he saw that it wasn't a red hat in the sky, but the sun. Then he fell right back into the sea with the biggest splash you've ever seen. All the other little fishes swam around him and said, Why haven't you brought back that red hat? It's not a red hat, he told them. It's the sun. And they all laughed at him. Don't be silly, they said. And they swam away to play games. I learnt something today. If you go out there and you discover things for yourself, it'll enrich the mind and you'll learn new things. Sometimes people might not believe you, but they'll just have to see for themselves. But at least you'll have a fantastic tale to tell. Oh well. Until then, see you next time.
you know what a whale's favourite food is? I bet you don't. I've got a story here that might shed some light on it. This is called The Story of Zzz and it's dedicated to Hannah. Once upon a time there was a great big whale whose name was Nicky. He was as big as 33 girls and boys standing in a row. There was one thing that Nicky liked better than anything else in the world, and that was honey. Now Nicky had a friend whose name was Zzz, and here's a picture of him. Zzz was a little fly who lived in Mummy's kitchen. One day Zzz was going for a walk on the kitchen ceiling when he saw a notice that Mummy had nailed to the wall. So he flew down and stood on the kitchen table and read it. Zzz. Please buzz off. Well, he thought, that's not very friendly. I'll go and stay with Nicky. At any rate, he loves me. So he said goodbye to Marmy the cat and flew out the window. As soon as he got out of the window, he saw some bees gathering honey. I wish I was a bee, he said. Then I could gather honey too. But he wasn't, so he couldn't. He wanted to take some honey to Nicky. So he sat on a hollyhock and thought. Then a friend of his, Buzzy Bee, came and sat down beside him. Why are you so thoughtful, Zzz? he said. Well, said Zzz, I want some honey for my friend Nicky. I'm going to stay with him and I'd like to take him a present, but I don't know how to get any honey. Well, I'll tell you what to do, said Zzz. He whispered in Zzz's ear. Zzz was ever so pleased and flew to where Nicky was in the sea. When he got there, Nicky was sound asleep, having his afternoon nap. Zzz tiptoed very quietly so as not to wake him. He got a great big jar and took the top off and waited. Presently, he heard a buzzing sound which got louder and louder and louder and along came a bee who flew around the jar and then emptied a little bag of honey onto it. Then some more bees came and emptied their honey bags into the jar. There were hundreds of them, and they all emptied their honey bags till the jar was quite full. Then they said goodbye to Zzz and flew back to the garden where they lived. Presently Nicky woke up, and when he saw the jar of honey that Zzz had got for him, he opened up his mouth wide as he could, and Zzz poured the honey in. Yum, 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 said Nicky. That was nice and he gave Zzz a great big sticky kiss. Then he yawned, Where's Zzz? he said. Hmm, must have flown away. Oh well, I think I'll have another little sleep. But Zzz hadn't flown away. He stuck to him. He struggled to get free, pulling first with one leg and then the other, and at last he got free and went for a walk on Nicky's back. Nicky was so long that it took him nearly an hour to reach his tail. When he got back, Nicky had woken up and they had a lovely time playing Zzz's favourite game, which was to sit on Nicky's blowhole and be blown high up into the air. And the captains of all the ships that passed used to watch them through their telescopes. My, 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 what fun that fly has, they said. I learned something from that story, and that's having good friends can lead to some amazing adventures. If you have the right positive encouragement and love in your heart, it can go a long way. Maybe high up into the air, like zzz. Oh well. That was another story. And I'll see you next time. loads of them. In fact, I've got so many, sometimes I don't know which one to wear. 
I think I've got a story about that. Today's story is called Heppy's Three Hats and is dedicated to Hayden and Ruby Sue. Mr. Heppenstall had three hats and he wore them one on top of the other. All the people who lived in the high street, the doctor, the greengrocer, the chimney sweep, in fact everybody thought, isn't Mr. Heppenstall polite? He lifts his hats three times whenever he meets us, once for each hat. Sometimes when he was out, Mr. Heppenstall would sing. My name is Mr. Heppenstall, I wear three hats at once. Some say that I am foolish, some say that I am a dunce. But I don't care what people say. I like wearing three hats a day, hooray for me is what I say. I'll wear them all at once. But there were times when Mr. Heppenstall felt sad, because though he wore three hats, he only had two hands. So he could only lift two hats at once, and had to put one of them under his arms, before he could lift the third. I do wish I could lift all three at once, he thought. Just then, who should come along but Mr. Heppenstall's cat, Marmy? Where are you going to, Marmy? said Mr. Heppenstall. I'm going to the fishmonger to get some fish, said Marmy. Will you ride on my shoulder? said Mr. Heppenstall. And if we meet the doctor, or the greengrocer, or the chimney sweep, or the doctor's wife, or the chimney sweep's wife, or anybody at all, will you lift one of my hats for me? All right, said Marmy, jumping on to Mr. Heppenstall's shoulder. At that moment, who should come along but the doctor's wife, Mrs. Smart? Good morning, Mrs. Smart, said Mr. Heppenstall, lifting one hat with one hand, and the other hat with the other while Marmy lifted the third. Good morning, Mr. Heppenstall, replied Mrs. Smart. What a polite man, she thought. Then Mr. Heppenstall said, Thank you, Marmy, thank you, dear. You are the best of cats to jump up on my shoulder and help me lift my hats. I think I've learnt something today from that story. It's always good to get a little help from your friends. Sometimes they can make your life just a little bit richer. Ah oh well, that was the story. See you next time. playing fun games. I do too. A lot of the time with some of my friends. But sometimes things can go a little bit too far. In fact, I have a story about that. This is called The Cockadoodle Doo and the Sun and it's dedicated to Maddie and Dante. Once upon a time there was a Cockadoodle Doo whose name was Cocky. He was made of brass except for one leg which was made of iron and fixed on the top of a tall steeple of a church built on a hill. The sun rose from behind the hill, not far from Cocky's steeple, and passed very close every morning, so close that Cocky could just touch it with one brass wing if he stretched hard enough. Now the sun was always very hungry first thing in the morning, and liked a bit of toast for breakfast. One morning, as he was making the toast, he felt a tickle. He looked down to see what it was. It was nothing unusual, just cocky in the steeple, nothing else. So he had a little scratch to make his tickle better. But when he looked back at the toast, he had burnt it, and there was no more bread. He was in a bad temper and hid behind the clouds and wouldn't shine all day. Next morning he made some more toast and just as it was getting brown he felt a tickle. So he looked down and had a little scratch and when he looked back the toast was burnt again. He was annoyed. He threw down the toast and squeezed the clouds to make them rain. And down on the earth there were storms and floods and thunder and lightning. You never heard such a to-do. Next day the sun got up early and began to make toast again. 
and just as it was nearly made he felt a tickle again. This time he kept an eye on the toast and scratched without looking down, but the tickle got worse so he looked down quickly and back again and there was the toast burnt again. Though he hardly looked away for a moment, it was all black as cinder. He didn't say anything. He didn't get angry. He just crossed his fingers and kept calm and counted to ten, and then counted to ten again, and then he felt better. Next morning, when it was time to make the toast, he held out the toasting fork but didn't put any bread on it. Then he just waited, and sure enough, in a minute, there was a tickling again. He put down the toasting fork very quickly and looked at the place where the tickle was. There was nothing unusual there, just cocky in the steeple. He looked more closely than closer still, and then saw that Cocky was stretching out his wing and tickling him at the tip of it. Well, I never, said the son. It was you that was tickling me, was it? Do you know you've made me burn my toast three mornings in a row? You are a naughty cock a doodle doo. Oh, I am sorry, said Cocky. I didn't mean to burn your toast. I was just tickling you for fun. Well, don't do it again, said the sun. No, I won't, said Cocky. The next morning the sun rose and made the toast and there wasn't any tickling and the toast didn't get burnt. So without saying anything, he got out the toasting fork again and made another piece and spread it thick with butter and gave it to Cocky. Yummity yum yum, said Cocky. Isn't this delicious? Thank you very much, son. And he twirled round three times. Cock a doodle doo, he crowed. Crook a doodle doo, cock a doodle doo. <coughs> he couldn't crow any more. All he could do was cough. A crumb had gotten stuck in his throat. Oh, you silly old cock a doodle doo, said the sun as he patted his back. You are a silly old cock a doodle doo. And he laughed and he laughed and he laughed. You know, I think I've learnt something from that story. It's all good to have some fun in games, but it's better to talk to people unless you take things a bit too far. It's better to get consent and have fun while you're doing it. Ah well, that was today's story. See you next time. fears of something or other. In fact, today I've got a story about that. It's called The Little Bus Who Was Afraid of the Dark. And it's dedicated to Logan and George. Once upon a time there was a little red bus who lived in a garage with his mother and his father. Every morning all three of them were filled up with petrol, oil, air and water. And then they were carried people backwards and forwards from the village where they lived to the big town by the sea. The little bus had often done the journey in the daytime but never at night. He was very afraid of the dark. His mother said, listen, I'll tell you a story. Once upon a time, the mother bus said, long, long ago, the dark was afraid of buses. And the dark's mother, who was as beautiful as a white crocus, said to the dark, you mustn't be afraid. It's daytime now. But if you don't go out and hide the world and make it dark, people won't know it's time to go to sleep, and the stars won't know when to come out and shine. So come on, try, try very slowly. So the dark, which had been hiding behind the sun, came out and crept down to the streets and houses. Buses were rushing here and there. The dark tried to be brave and crept down further. The lamps were lit in the streets, and the bus drivers turned their lights on. Still the dark came down, and before it knew what was happening, a bus rushed right through it, sounding its horn. What a surprise, yet it felt rather nice. A bit tickly, perhaps, but very pleasant. After that, a lot of buses rushed through the dark with their lights shining, 
and the people inside buying tickets, getting up and sitting down, had a wonderful time. Later on, when the moon shone and the dark played hide-and-seek among the houses, and in the morning the sun rose and took the dark home to its mother, and it wasn't afraid of buses any more. When she had told him the story, the little bus said, I'm ready to go out now, mother. And the driver came and started his engine and switched the lights on. And people came in and sat down. The conductor rang the bell and away they went, out into the dark, down the high street, to the big town by the sea. I think I've learnt something today from this story. We all have fears, no matter how big or small we are. Even a grumpy old uncle can be afraid of a few things. But it's always better to talk to one another about our fears. And maybe, just maybe, with the right help, we might be able to overcome those fears. Ah oh well, that was a good story. But until then, I'll see you next time.